since the beginning of humankind, you know, humans always have colonized water bodies, whether it's to find actually water for drinking supply or find fish for eating or game that would be attracted by the, by the water bodies. Uh, they, you know, all the time like to be around these water bodies. And then in the future, after they actually switch from gather or enter to uh, agriculture, they actually need more water. And after that, we get into the industrialized revolution and we need even more water to run the factories. So as you see, the uh, or, uh, hydro system are very, very, very heavily, uh, um, have a lot of pressure from humans. And for sure, Florida is no exception to this. So what I'm gonna talk about today are about all of these ponds that we have around us. And you'll see that they actually are not natural and they serve a very good purpose. But they can be also very, very cool looking. That's this one that you see here on the screen. You know, you see the reflection of the sky to that mirror-like surface, and you see the reflection of the trees. And as uh, Henry uh, David Thoreau was talking about that Walden Pond, which looks like a gem, like a diamond, so clear that you could see down to the bottom and see the shiners and the perch, and you can even take your canoe and have a very, very nice paddling trip across that pond. That is so beautiful, right? So when we look at this uh, pond, in Florida, we have actually thousands of them. And they're not natural to the environment. They actually were man-built. Uh, we only have a few ponds that our lakes that actually are natural in Florida, especially in southwest Florida. So when you combine all these dots between Collier County and uh, Lee County, we actually have about 10,000 of these ponds. Yes, 10,000. And when you combine all these dots together, it's about the same size, or actually 1.5 times the size of the Caloosahatchee River in surface area. So this is not a thin thing. It's actually a pretty important impact on the system. So why do we have all these ponds? What is the purpose? Well, two main things. Mainly, they're supposed to keep the water for a certain amount of time and deliver it at the right time during the rainy season uh, uh, the way the system used to be. And they also will be cleaning the water for nutrient and other pollutants. So why do we need that? Well, prior to uh, human actually colonizing uh, the system, we had a lot of vegetation. You know, humans were not there. And when it rains during the dry or the rainy season, the water actually has time to uh, be slowed down by the vegetation and has time to infiltrate and recharge the aquifer. All right, and during uh, the rainy season, really, we actually have sheet flow of water that will be running off the, uh, the landscape. Uh, the vegetation will actually pick up some of the uh, silt and uh, nutrients so that the water delivery to the coast will be very, very minimal and uh, especially very, very clean. Now, after urbanization, you know, people build a lot of roads, a lot of houses, lots of uh, uh, impervious surface, which basically do not let the water percolate to the ground. And when you have this, you have a lot of freshwater influx down to the uh, downstream ecosystem, especially the ocean. And uh, because of this, you're picking up a lot of freshwater, picking up a lot of nutrient, a lot of silt and metals. And the nutrient, you know, we know that a little nutrient is good, but too much nutrient is not good because you create algae bloom and drift seaweed algae, especially in the coast. Uh, having too much fresh water is also not good because you will dilute the salt water and the salt water will become too fresh and you can kill your oyster, you can kill your uh, sea, um, uh, sea grasses as well as damage your coral reefs. Now, when you have metals, obviously some of them can be very toxic and also damage your ecosystem. Now, dust is making the water kind of turbid and uh, your water bec becoming turbid, you kind of block the photosynthesis and can smother organism as well. So how can we fix this? Well, in the 1980s, uh, what engineer designed are these ponds, these ponds I talked to you guys about, as I said, they're not natural, they're man-made, and uh, the goal of these ponds is to uh, retain or detain the water for a certain amount of time, especially during the dry season, so that the water will be able to infiltrate and recharge the aquifers the way it used to be. On top of that, during the rainy season, this pond will be overflowing and 80% clean water will be released down to the system, especially the marine systems. The water will be, again, 80% clean. Keep that number in your, in your mind. Uh, how do we achieve that? Well, we use actually natural filtration using green technologies where we use all the plants all around the pond that do some filtration that I'm already aforementioned. We also have all the plants growing on the side, on the littoral zone of the pond that actually continue to polish that water, and then the algae will try to finish polishing that water, so the water is 80% clean. Everything else that is not being uptaken and not filtered will actually sediment to the bottom of the pond so that during the rainy season, the pond will overflow and release 80% clean water 
the way it used to be. So we're mimicking the regular time pattern of the water, and the, and the water is cleaner. It looks wonderful, right? The problem is that uh, we have a lot of people that move down here, and they're not from here. And they basically look at these ponds as what we talk, what we would say are ponds that look like glacier lake ponds, because this is where they're coming from. They're coming from up north, and they have glacial lakes here. And these glacial lakes have actually a lot of turf all around, and they actually don't have a lot of uh, vegetation, especially emergent vegetation in the center. So these ponds have morphed from a filtering device to actually a landscape, uh, nicely, aesthetically appealing ponds, according, according to them, of course. Um, so we'll sh I'll show you here uh, an example. This is actually the turf that they want to have, and turf is not native from Florida. You need actually a lot of effort to maintain that turf in Florida. You got to do a lot of watering, you got to give them a lot of nutrient, you got to mow them often, and you also have to use a lot of pesticide to prevent, for example, all the plants from encroaching into your lawn or also bugs to actually eat your lawn. So uh, what you got to do is do all the things, and eventually they will wash off into the lake later on. So that's actually adding a loading of nutrient and other pollutant that the pond has to clean up. I would like to mention that turf is actually the number one, number one grown crop in Florida. This is not citrus, this is not uh, sugar cane, it's actually turf. And turf has been grown especially south of Lake Okeechobee, where uh, you, know, you use all this pesticide, all this nutrient, all that water to make sods that actually has been planted around this, these ponds. And you can damage especially stars of Lake Okeechobee, the Everglades that we all cherish. So keep in mind that you also have implication outside of Southwest Florida. But let's go back to Southwest Florida and look also how real estate understood that you can make a lot of money by having front view properties. And these are extreme cases where you have a very convoluted pond, so you can put a lot of houses around, meaning also a lot of green, lush turf which actually is evil here because it will bring again all these nutrient and pollutant to the edge of the water. So this is basically what the, owner, the, the homeowner wants to see, you know, green, lush uh, turf was gently, gently sloping down to the edge of the water, no really any emergent vegetation, so nothing to clean actually the pollutant running into the pond. And when you have green uh, turf, you generally will have green pond and generally you are you have uh, algae growing. So here you can see on the, if, if you see very well along the shoreline, you actually have algae growing, but if we do a close-up, sometimes that can completely smother your entire pond by this proliferation of algae. Not very nice looking, isn't it? And uh, is it another close-up, and especially if you look at the top right pictures, is that actually toxic algae. So you can even grow toxic algae as well. So how do we fix this? Well, the cheapest and most inexpensive uh, way to do this is actually to use algaecide, and mainly copper-based algaecide. And this copper will clean up your pond, and that vegetation will, oh, it's, it's gone, it's just sunk down to the water, so we don't see it, it's okay. Uh, however, you also have collateral effect. You know, collateral effect means that you're destroying the organism that actually uh, eat the algae. The zooplankton, you know, eat the algae, but the copper kills them. They also will be killing your mollusks. The mollusk especially is a clam that filters the water and clean also out of the, uh, the algae out of your pond. So what's happening is that you have a pond that has no other way of controlling the algae than adding copper sulfate again and again and again. So this is what it looks like when you have all this killing of plants and algae and organism. You know, you're basically collecting a lot of muck on the bottom of your pond. And that muck is very toxic because it's got all the metals that have not been filtered by the vegetation. All the copper, as you see on that slide here, that, you know, this purple and orange is very high concentration of copper because we use that to kill the, uh, the algae. And we also have all the nutrient and the organic matter which will be uh, decomposing and when you're decomposing it, you're actually releasing a lot, of, a lot of CO2 and you're eating all the oxygen and you can have fish kill. So you have a lot of sediment accumulation. That sediment again is toxic, so is the water. We're very, very far away from the model. If I show you again that slide, you'll see that you have one number that has changed. The water used to be 80% clean. Now it's minus 190 for some extreme cases, meaning you have actually a pollution exceeding the pond and not really clean water. And that water will escape to, for example, the, uh, the downstream ecosystem, mainly the bay, and it can also pollute the groundwater, which is actually a topic I'm researching right now. 
So this is a, a way uh, to prove you that it's true. If we use copper in the water as a traceability of that water for exiting from this pond, this is uh, Naples Bay. You can see that you have this hot spot in red here during the dry or wet season that shows you that they're actually coming from this pond. And along with them, a lot of nutrients. And these nutrients will grow, create algae bloom, seaweed uh, growing, and you will have also the, the metal that can actually be very, very toxic to the, to the mollusks, the oysters, etc. So very bad. Uh, now the trend is that the number of ponds will increase. You've probably seen that since the economy started back again in 2008, we have a lot of construction. And we can see from Google Earth that they're still making these very highly convoluted ponds, and probably the turf is still the number one grown plant all around. So we could end here and say, OK, we're not really optimistic. But that's not the way I am. I'm a fighter. That's why I'm here today. And basically, we have one tool that we can use, education. And basically, we have all these entities here on, uh, shown on the screen that actually have workshop where we invite, or sometimes they all want to come to this workshop to understand better what is a healthy pond and what I can do to actually help this pond to function very well. Because I have desperate people coming all the time and say, what do I do with my pond? You know, it's all green. I can't sell my house. Well, you've got to change the way you actually manage these ponds. So we also also run workshops for people who manage the pond and people who manage also the, uh, the, the, all, all the vegetation around these ponds. So they actually get a certificate and they can actually use it as, OK, I'm doing the right thing. You should hire me because I know what I'm doing. Now, this is an example when homeowners are very reluctant to do some planting around. We basically take the planting and we put it on a floating mat called a floating island. And these uh, uh, plants are basically growing hydroponically, meaning they, have, they are roots hanging in the water. And these roots will be taking the nutrients. That's good. And they will also will be releasing chemicals that actually fight algae growth. That's from a research I, I just conducted. And when the plants are grown, you can actually remove them and plant them around the shoreline. Once finally you've told the homeowner that it's good, and uh, you can continue the cycle again and again. Now, you can also do some uh, planting of native plants. You know, turf is not the only answer to ground cover. And here we have native plants that are being planted around ponds. And you can even do it even if your HOA does not allow, allow this to you. Because you have the BL2080 that actually protects you, and you can do this. All right, and it looks beautiful compared to grass, right? Now, you can also create rain garden, which I call rain garden, because they actually uh, create a funnel where the water will be, uh, be funneling through, and the plant will remove all these nutrients and pollutants, and you will protect your pond very well. Now, that last slide here is really something that inspired me, because even golf courses start to do this. As you can see, uh, uh, if you have a golf course here with a lot of vegetation all around, golfers are not happy because they lose their golf ball there. But you know, who cares? It's actually working. And they also understand that you're going to do some planting near all inlets that actually are getting into uh, this pond by doing planting. And planting can be fun, as you can see. So as you can see, I think we can still cope with this stormwater pond. And you can still say, I moved to a lake. We know it's a stormwater pond. I know it's not very sexy as a name, but actually <laughs> it's very, very good to move next to it. And it can be beautiful, especially if you turn it like a Everglade-like system with native plants. So please tell to other people who actually have ponds and tell them about that good news that there's actually, actually our detention, retention ponds. They actually are cleaning the lake, are cleaning the water, and they're very useful. Thank you very much.